I'm so excited to be here. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be in New York. So I'm going to be talking about digital literacy, particularly programming literacy. So it's important when we use a term to think about the term just a little bit. So looking at the word um, literacy, we really need to think about illiteracy, which is always defined in terms of disadvantage. Um, and if you look at the history of illiteracy as opposed to the history of literacy, what you see is systemic processes excluding people from literacy. Uh, certain classes of people, as a matter of fact, and you could think of two right off the bat, um, women and uh, slaves in American history. And in fact, there was a talk just yesterday where the statistics for literacy were put on the screen, but in fact, they were the statistics of illiteracy. And of the millions of illiterate people in the world, two thirds of those are still women. So these are still categories of disadvantage. So um, why and how? Uh, why? Would you want to systemic, systematically keep anybody illiterate? Um, and the reason is that social advantages come from literacy. And if you make the illiterate literate, you have a social mobility. And if you're trying to uh, protect your class, you, you don't want that mobility happening. So how do you keep people illiterate? If you want to keep people illiterate, how are you going to do it? One word, code. What's code? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary tells us it's a system of words, letters, figures, other symbols substituted for other words, letters, especially for the purposes of teaching. So you take one language which is understandable, people are literate in it, and you translate it into a language where the people cannot read or understand for a purpose of teaching. All right, so quick, quick visit to my graduate student past. If you've been to graduate school, you've had some sort of similar experience in which uh, two competing kinds of code uh, happen to graduate students. You have to take advanced statistics and you have to take advanced social theory. And generally what happens is a sorting of students uh, by code. So uh, people feel more comfortable with this form of code or they feel through statistical notation or they feel more comfortable with uh, social theory, which is a kind of code. This is actually uh, a very famous quote by Judith Butler. She won, um, she's a famous social theorist, who won an award for the most tangled and tortured uh, prose ever. Uh, for that, I've provided a translation at the bottom. Um, but here's the thing about this in graduate school is that you gravitate toward one or the other because you feel excluded from the other. And it's generally a sense of exclusion that comes from not understanding and not being comfortable with the language that's being spoken. And people identify with one of these or the other. And these, this division uh, really recapitulates a larger division uh, in the academy um, between humanities and STEM, um, between qualitative and quantitative research when it comes down to research. And the social sciences are poised in the middle, uncomfortably in the middle between the humanities and STEM. And people in those social sciences feel forced to be on one side or the other. You are either in Digitopolis with the mathematician or you are in Dictionopolis with Knirvez the unabridged. And in the story of the Phantom Tollbooth, a little boy named Milo drives into this land and discovers a completely absurd place where math has become completely absurd, where language has become completely absurd because these two brothers fought with each other and did not like each other. And they, um, they tossed out of the kingdom, their kingdoms, rhyme and reason, the princesses rhyme and reason. And with them gone, both math and uh, literature uh, language became um, absurd and impossible to understand. So uh, what, what's the good thing about code? Why do we have code? Well, uh, code can, it says language up there in Greek letters, uh, can be elegant and efficient. And jargon, of course, allows people in a little small field uh, to speak to each other and understand each other and further very complex thoughts. There, there's really, there's reasons for jargon and there's reasons for code. Um, but of course, code and jargon also uh, serve as gatekeepers and they exclude people uh, from those language communities. And so you end up with coders, basically a room of coders, a room of computer science programmers, pretty much looks like this. And obviously, everybody knows this is a problem. And lots of people are working to address this problem. So it's a diversity problem. CS has a diversity problem. And so we have all kinds of amazing and wonderful initiatives uh, that um, raise excitement around STEM, try to get um, underrepresented men and women into uh, STEM clubs, tech clubs, after school clubs, camps, all these things, um, and, and these games get kids interested in these things. And these are wonderful, and I am involved in them. And these next couple of pictures are from the Champaign-Urbana um, Fab Lab, where we have a beautiful 
uh, community access uh, maker space. So uh, we offer all kinds of courses and uh, they actually take it on the road. They actually, um, the staff of the, of the Fab Labs take their show on the road to Boys and Girls Clubs and to rural, uh, rural towns and to libraries, to some of libraries and we do some amazing things. Uh, I'm not interested in that or talking about that. I am interested in it, but I'm not talking about it today. What I'm talking about is the other kids. Uh, the kids whose gifts and career ambitions are not to be found in STEM and are not going to be found in STEM and their social networks do not make it easy for them to go to a tech club. There's no, there's no way in for them. They have no friends there. You know, my daughter was the only girl in tech club you know, the first year of middle school and then she left us, of course, because she was the only girl there in tech club, right? Um, shouldn't literacy be for everybody? Literacy, that's the word, the word is literacy. Shouldn't we take that, uh, shouldn't we take that literally? so to speak. So what if we also taught programming outside of STEM? Outside of STEM. Also, see the word also? Not that we don't teach programming the way we teach programming, but why don't we also teach it outside of STEM? Why don't we teach it in, what if we taught programming not in code but in English? What if we taught it in language arts and social studies class? What if we taught it literally everywhere? Here are, you know who these are? Rhyme and reason. So these are the princesses who are banished uh, from the land when Digitopolis and Digitopolis split. And if you bring them back, really interesting things can happen. So this is what my work is about. First, uh, for a second, let's talk about rhyme. Um, stands in for me for thinking narratively. Narrative thinking, what is narrative thinking? Uh, you think thematically, you think empathically, you think imaginatively. Uh, these are the strengths and the powers and the literacies of narrative storytelling. Well, what's the thinking of reason, the reason side? Well, what does it mean to think computationally? You think logically, you think ontologically, you think algorithmically, the things that you need, the ways you need to think to be a programmer to write code. Uh, but what if you allow them both to exist in the same educational space? What do you get? Well, I call it, here it comes, dripping from the sky, narrative-based computational thinking. That's what you get. If you allow rhyme and reason to come back, um, and stop these guys from fighting. Um, so I teach uh, narrative-based computational thinking. That's its academic E, but basically I teach programming through the writing of interactive fiction, text-based games. So I teach uh, people, and I teach people, well, I'll get to it in a minute. I teach it when I'm teaching programming, I teach it when I'm not teaching programming. I teach it when I teach anything. Um, so, but uh, one word, anybody play interactive fiction? Anybody play any of these games on the screen here, Zor, for any Infocom games? Okay, so I don't, I don't need to give everybody a total introduction. But interactive fiction was the first uh, form of digital game, right? It was the first computer game. Uh, it had a huge market share uh, in the 80s. It was the only market share in the 80s <laughs> for a, a, a long period. Um, and now we don't say text adventures anymore. We generally say interactive fiction as the umbrella term. Um, so they disappeared from the market. Um, because when graphics came in, um, but it didn't really go away. Uh, it just was displaced uh, into sort of the hobby market, into the uh, niche uh, world, sort of. Um, I was involved in some of these pre-internet uh, bulletin boards where interactive fiction was actively made and promoted and shared and enjoyed, and, uh, and the people who wrote it were also writing graphics-based games. So the transition was quite organic and the people who wrote IF continued to write IF. So what we have today uh, is a completely continuous community of IF writers. Um, the IF Comp has been going on for 23 years and it's run by the Interactive Fiction Technology Foundation, which I'm on the board of directors of and I've just started an education committee. So we're starting a, a huge new initiative uh, in encouraging IF use among educators. We're gonna be creating uh, resource websites, we're gonna be creating curriculum, we're gonna be looking for grants, we're gonna be really in a big way um, promoting, um, not only in the way that I'm promoting it today as a, as a way to teach programming, but also um, for all the reasons we teach game design in every other way, uh, another aspect of game design. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the programming part today, so that's what I'm talking to you about. So if you've heard about any, um, a language used for making IF, uh, you've probably heard of Twine. Yes, anybody written anything in Twine? Yes, Twine is great. If you've, if you've never worked with Twine, go get it. Five minutes, you're in, you'll be in love. Um, uh, it's hypertext hyper based. That means it's a click game. You, you click through, it's all text. Uh, although um, 
you, you can't incorporate graphics in it, but pure twine is, is, is all words. Um, and the beauty of it is that it requires no programming knowledge. That's, that's its advantage. You can take it in uh, to kids or anybody of any age and they're writing interactive narrative and even games. So it isn't um, just interactive narrative as literature. Um, it, it can also be a, a legit game. So really quick here, here would be a scene from a little game written in twine uh, based on The Hobbit, okay? So do I get my little pointer here? Okay, I can't really click on the screen, but you're at the shoreline of a vast and deep underground lake. The water is black. A silvery fish is swimming near the shore. Let us examine ourselves. We are Smeagol of an ancient hobbit-like race. We're wearing a golden ring. We can't see it. We're invisible. Let's examine the ring. It's the one ring, but we don't know that. It's only our precious. So let's grab the fish. We grab it with our fingers. Uh, and we eat it. No need to go orc hunting today. So a little quick game in twine. Now let's see the same uh, game written in Inform 7, which is the language that I teach. Inform 7 is the most popular language used for writing parser-based interactive fiction, which is the kind where you have to type English words in and the program responds to you. Um, this is what a generic Inform 7 game looks like. It says same thing, you're at the shore, a fish is swimming by, you type in, examine the fish, the fish looks juicy and sweet, you take the fish, you grab it with your fingers, you take a bite, and no need to go orc hunting today. Same game, two delivery systems, two ways of communicating with the game. Uh, the languages are quite different. So this is what twine development environment looks like. It's so easy to understand. You have the boxes, you have the text, you see the arrows and the connections, uh, between the links of your interactive story. If you're not using Twine, absolutely go, go, go tonight and check out Twine. Um, Inform 7 looks quite different. It looks like a programming language development environment, which in fact it is. So on the left you have code, you click compile, and the game runs for you on the right. So everything's done inside uh, the development environment of Inform. Uh, which makes it great um, to use when you're teaching because the kids are all inside their little system there. Um, so I use it. Um, I, I also teach Twine, but for different reasons. I teach Inform 7 as a first programming language. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not interested in the games they're making, but the reason why I use it is because I'm deliberately using it to teach programming. And it does everything that any other programming language does uh, internally. Uh, variables, conditions, loops, functions, loops, tables, all these things that you need uh, to understand to, uh, to use a regular programming language. Uh, and it does these narratively. So what does that mean? So that's what I call narrative-based context. Let me skip through this a little bit just to say it's an object-oriented programming language. Uh, and when you might learn about how to program a button on a website, which is an object which has attributes of all other buttons. And you can get that probably, you know, when you're learning to code, here are button attributes, it can be clicked, it does something when you click it, it has attributes. But see, I think it's way easier to understand that Gollum is a data object. Okay, Gollum is a data object. Gollum is a kind of person. Uh, he has attributes, he has the ability to wear things, he can wear a ring. Uh, the ring is a data object, and the ring has attributes, it's wearable, it does something to you when you wear it, you become invisible. Um, these are all the same things that are happening when you make a website, but it's a story which allows you to understand the data object differently and interact with it differently. So if, if I could do this in Python, I could write that little Gollum game in Python really easily, and if you did, you were gonna use some XML code that looks like this to make the descriptions, and if you were, or anybody a programmer actually, you can attest that this is so readable, it's like English, right? I mean, if you're a programmer, this is not like, why do you even call that code? This is extremely understandable. Um, it's made to be accessible and understandable. But if you don't program, that looks like gobbledygook. So this is what the same setting up the data object would look like in Inform 7. Okay, right, so if I say to you now, this is Inform 7 code, after you take my course in Inform 7, you who are trying to minor in informatics and cannot for the life of you pass that CS course that is required to get you through that informatics minor, if you take my course, you will pass your programming course, maybe not with an A, but without any issue. Now I'm gonna make a procedure, also called a function or a rule. In Inform, we call it a rule. Um, and it has in it um, 
a, a condition. If you're in Hogwarts and if the time is nine o'clock, something's gonna happen. What's that something? Okay, now here's the tricky line. Repeat with X running through Tom Wizards. Well, let's just think about that in English. Repeat, that means we're gonna look at a couple of wizards and when we're looking at a given wizard, we're just gonna call him X for a minute. We're gonna look for all wizards who are in that location who are calm. So just give me the list of all the wizards who are calm in that space and we're gonna look at them one at a time. And if the wizard we're looking at in that moment is distressed, and if his level of distress is five, we're gonna go to the table, find his name, find his noise, and report it back to the screen, and we're gonna change his variable to disturbed, okay? Right? So very easy. What we have here is a loop, a list, <laughs> uh, a table, data retrieved from a table, and a change of attributed value, right? But we've done it, all we've done is, here we are in Hogwarts, who's here who's basically calm, but their distress is rising, now we're gonna change them all to disturbed. And in a game, if you're there, uh, this is what will play into the screen. If all four people are there and they're all up to level five distress, Ronald Fark, Hermione Sneeze, Harry Kaufner will leave. Okay, and of course the screen. Um, so how I teach this is through collaborative coding. So my students have a sandbox and I have sandboxes with it. It's called the quad game. That's the U of I, if you've never been there, it's quite impressive, the U of I quad. Um, and you see those three X's right in the middle of this map, you see those X's. So. Uh, uh, over the last three years, uh, more than 50 students have created an IF uh, on our campus, 300 locations, thousands of items, we're pushing 200,000 words now, um, and it's a sandbox. Um, they, they go in here, they uh, improve the bugs of the previous students, they write their own. There's 42 endings, different endings to the game, and it goes on and on, it's never meant to end. Um, and uh, this is uh, my model of teaching. I, do, I, I should do a different presentation on why I teach collaborative coding. Um, but it's a powerful tool, uh, but my ambitions are, are way larger than this, as a matter of fact. Um, I also teach IF in social science courses, and I teach a course on the racial history of uh, Illinois, and I teach these students to code. It's not a programming class, but I teach them to code in this uh, humanity social science class, about, and uh, together we're creating a digital uh, learning environment, which I call a cross between Wikipedia and Minecraft. Okay, if you can imagine this, it's a thing. It's a text-based Minecraft. Think about it like that. Um, and I call it the Illinois map. Uh, my goal is to teach the entire state of Illinois to program through this uh, massive public history uh, project. So at the moment, it's just internal to my, um, that's all, right? Uh, so I teach a course called Mapping Inequalities. I've been teaching it for the third time this fall and um, they uh, work together and uh, separately to simulate moments in uh, Illinois history of their choice. Um, and uh, we have an emphasis on empathy because the idea is the reason we're writing a simulation from that history is to try to immerse players into uh, the game, into the story. So I'm gonna give you uh, four quick examples with my remaining time as quick as I can. Uh, this is what our internal wiki looks like. So this isn't public yet, but this is what we work on in the class. And it looks like Wikipedia a little bit. Um, so they, at the top, give me a scenario. This is a Pullman strike scenario. The student says it's not much of a story. He just wants to put the player in. They read a newspaper, they talk to people, they find out what's going on, and then suddenly they're immersed. And he has to provide me with a historical background and links. He has to uh, uh, argue for its historic significance with secondary resources. He gives me primary resources, he gives me secondary resources. He gives me annotated links, which are not, they're not for me, they're for the next student who's gonna work on this project. Then he gives me code and he gives me a run through the game. And you can see, um, so this is the code, it gives you some of the descriptions, and at the end you see that you die. So you just get shot. So, so you're learning about it and then boom, you're dead. And um, it's actually fairly powerful as an immersive moment. It's a little short game. Uh, you find out about it, and next thing you know, you're dead. Now this one, the code is more complicated. This is about uh, contraband is the name that was given to uh, slaves who escaped from the South and came and settled in Illinois. They were called contraband. And this student actually found some specific people who came to Elgin, Illinois, and he wanted to make a game about their arrival in Illinois. Um, I skipped the other part of his code. He does some really interesting things. He uses up at the top, where's my little picture? Uh, he makes a number variable to keep track of conversations, so you can actually have fairly complex conversations with the NPCs, uh, the minister there. And then he creates a verb. He makes a, there's a baby. This is historically accurate. There was a baby. So the baby cries during the game, and he needed to make a, a, a verb for comforting the baby. So in his game, you comfort the baby. 
Uh, this is a really neat game that was very hard for me to read. Uh, this girl made, um, this young woman made a game about uh, the first African-American surgeon and she wanted to simulate heart surgery. So she, um, so she actually made a game where she makes us walk through a heart surgery as it would have been done at the time, right? So she did a tremendous amount of research to find out what that would have been like and it's gory and I had to kind of squint when I read it because I don't like stuff like that. But um, it, she was not a programmer. She had really a lot of trouble with it and she was really, really determined um, uh, to, to recreate this experience. And I'm gonna just read to you her reflection. Writing code was something I never would have imagined myself doing because one, I don't like math and two, my degree has nothing to do with coding. When I realized we'd be using words and sentences to code, I became confused. I was like, okay, now I definitely don't know how this class is gonna work. I keep seeing failed or error pop up on my screen and I really wanted to just drop the course. The joy I had when the game popped up on the right side of the screen definitely motivated me and I was like, okay, this is actually fun when it works. Everybody knows how to write, so using Inform is just an easier transition rather than learning a whole new coding language. I've raved about the program and the course to anybody that will listen and I've actually gotten such an interest that I'm looking towards gaining a minor in cybersecurity or some other form of coding to go along with my degree. So she goes from, I don't like math, I'm never gonna code, and she did, I just, she just emailed me to say she declared a minor in informatics, right? So uh, uh, this is the sort of outcome that I'm looking for um, in this course. All right, one more. Uh, this is a personal favorite of mine. Um, so she starts out by saying, this simulation begins at a local coffee shop in the year of 1985. The player is unaware of your exact identity just yet, right? And eventually you realize that you are Barack Obama, right? And she, um, she walks you through, it's a lovely little game, she walks you through key events in Obama's life, she recreates them with great care, um, and she had to invent a whole set of new verbs for Obama. So normally in a text adventure, what do you do? You take, you drop, you, um, you throw, you attack, you ask, you drink, you eat. When you're Barack Obama, you must, I think here it's sing, you must listen, you must witness, you must give, you must hug. So Barack Obama, as community organizer, she had to create all these new uh, verbs to be able to uh, simulate the life of Barack Obama. And if I may indulge um, her final reflection, in all my wildest dreams, I never thought I would ever consider myself a coder. I vividly remember sitting in the first class as a nervous first week freshman thinking, oh God, what have I gotten myself into? I soon figured out if you would take code rule by rule, step by step, it becomes a lot less intimidating. So every project I grew in confidence and capability. I've always loved President Obama, but after creating this simulation, I have a newfound respect. He built headfirst one of the most complex African-American communities in the country. He worked hard not for the people in charge, but for the individuals who were struggling. After taking this class, I find myself reflecting on it. I finally was able to relate to how it feels to be on the outside. I received looks of disbelief and questions of my abilities writing code, people teased her. While my experiences as a minority are far from the struggles of minorities facing extreme hardship, I feel as if I now stand next to them and want to fight for equal human rights. So what next? I take these experiences, become the best person I can be, and use my capabilities to help those who are in need. Because of this class, I am now a proud female computer coder, willing to fight for the people who need the voice I am willing to provide. And I have to say it again and give Meg the last word. I am now a proud female computer coder willing to fight for the people who need the voice I am willing to provide. And that's what my work is about. Thank you very much.